2000 to 2008 in Ramallah in the West Bank, uh, where I met my wife and we had two children. Um, we moved here in 2008. Whilst there I was working with local uh, non-government organisations uh, to train teachers and direct arts education projects in villages and refugee camps in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Um, I also worked with local dance and theatre companies and collectives on performance projects um, and film, uh, directed the film The Secret World, uh, which is a children's film in Arabic, um, which has been screened at festivals internationally. I researched my PhD there on the history of dance in Palestine, um, which I published as, as the book Raising Dust. And most of my research has focused on the use of dance in traumatized communities. Now today I want to talk a bit about some of the more complex issues associated with uh, boycotts within a society that is under military siege. I'm going to be taking kind of a devil's advocate position. While I've um, uh, published articles uh, and spoke at conferences internationally supporting um, the boycott and uh, uh, trying to promote an awareness of the Palestinian context, I think within discussions such as the one we have today, it's important also to bring a critical reflection on how these um, boycotts can function and the impact they can have. To give you a kind of a sense of this, I'm going to leave with a, a story from um, 1994, uh, the start of the Oslo peace process when there was a certain optimism um, within, the, within the political uh, relationship between um, Israel and Palestine, amongst some. Um, there was a production of Romeo and Juliet between Al Qasaba Theatre in a uh, Palestinian group and a, uh, an Israeli theatre company in which it was half Hebrew, half in Arabic, or spoken in both languages. Um, the Palestinians taking the Capulets' roles, the Israelis taking the Montagues' roles. Um, this production was subsequently toured internationally by the Israeli Ministry of um, uh, uh, International Affairs and um, was seen by many as being a whitewashing process to try to suggest that the problems between Israel and Palestine were stemmed similarly to the Romeo and Juliet story, just two people who can't get along. Um, and that this story itself was somehow a, uh, a end of the rainbow story where everything's going to work out now because now they're managing to get on fine. Um, now, the fallout from that subsequently meant within Palestinian society for many people um, who had been associated with that production were ostracized within Palestine. Um, this included directors, actors, uh, theatre companies, the Al Qasaba Theatre, but for many years and continues to, to this day to still be ostracized by, by many who will not work with the people involved in that production. Um, now, this has led within Palestine to a certain season and during the period in which I was there, was continual negotiation of well, who can work in this production, who can work together, who can't work together, um, as a result of that collaboration. Now, to kind of get a sense of where this came from, um, and to try to consider well, what is the point of a boycott, and how is it helping maintain a pluralistic, tolerant, inclusive, and future focused society uh, from within, I'm going to go back and, and, and look at the history of the cultural boycott within Palestine from the 1930s onward, and <coughs> some of the actions that have been taken since, and with particular consideration of the, uh, the current BBS program. Um, a lot of this is, is within Palestine, uh, the term cultural normalization is used, and resistance to cultural normalization, or the normalization of relationships between Palestinians and Israelis. It began in the uh, 1930s during the Great Revolt, or in terms of the first ones that I came across in my research when I was going back through kind of archival documents and, and, and getting oral histories of, of where did this come from within Palestine. In the 1930s, there were uh, refusals by the main theatres or hotels of that day, the Grand Hotel in, in uh, Ramallah and uh, in, in Jerusalem, which refused to have um, Zionist or European theater, uh, music groups playing in their hotels because at that stage it was a uh, kind of a cultural hub for the uh, the region, people coming from Jordan, from Lebanon, to, to, to enjoy evenings of theatre and dance and, and, and music and such at these hotels. Um, subsequent to 1948, the wider uh, Arab boycott or Arab states boycott of um, Israel meant that relationships between those living in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank were limited to um, with 
those inside the Green Line, uh, and there was a general boycott that no cultural interaction happened. Following the 1967 war, uh, 68 war, sorry, the, um, it became more complex as a large number of Palestinians found themselves under occupation. Um, this meant that there was both <coughs> the Palestinians who were within inside the Green Line, or the 1948 borders of Israel, uh, the, those who were carrying Jerusalem ID, and then those within the West Bank, Bank and Gaza Strip who had a different set of stands and identifications. As a result, each of them had, uh, the different people had different levels of interaction with uh, Israelis. Um, and so those using municipal, community and cultural centers within the, 19, within the green line of Israel were often boycotted because they were seen as being part of something that was funded by the Israeli government. Um, during the, the Oslo period, there was a Romeo and Juliet production. There was also a Spanish flamenco troupe that came to perform at the Palestine International Festival in 1998. It was all lined up to come in until it was identified that two of the um, dancers within it had held Israeli passports. So then that troupe was denied entry into the festival. Um, but it probably really grew to a point in, in uh, the late 90s and early 2000s with the um, East West of Art Orchestra, which was a um, a project established by Edward Said and uh, Daniel Barenboim to bring Palestinian and Arab musicians together with Israeli musicians, uh, children, young people. Um, at the time I had great cynicism for this as I had for the um, that were sponsored by the United States and, and USA to bring Palestinian and Israeli children together in camps in Colorado to play together for a little while. And so all they really needed was that space and everything else was was just the problem of two kids not being able to get on. The problem with that was the children were then went back to their respective communities and felt, um, and many of the Palestinians that I've felt, felt terribly ashamed and um, subsequently humiliated by that process of having participated in those events. So I had very similar concerns for the Baron point. Okay. Um, and but this may want to be presented in, um, in 2004 in in Palestine, in Ramallah, there was a, a presentation of the orchestra and there was big debates around who would go and attend this performance and what, how it would be perceived, how it would be received. Uh, Baron Boehm's statements in the Knesset um, condemning the military occupation went a long way to uh, addressing some of the concerns, but not all the way, for those who were of, of a perspective, and particularly those within the BDS who were of an outright perspective of we do not have any interaction. So that's kind of in a nutshell some of the uh, historical context of where the cultural boycott has, has gone through during that period. I'm just going to tell you about my own entry into it and how I've tried to negotiate and navigate it. I was fairly uh, naive when I first arrived in Palestine in 1998 um, and taught the first workshop in Ramallah, a dance workshop. Um, I'd been a ballet dancer, and you know, as you can imagine ballet dancers are probably not known for their political activism and they understand it as well. Um, but I'd moved out of ballet several years previous and got into modern dance and then engaged more in community dance projects around the world in Africa, Asia, uh, Middle East. And I'd worked with Israeli companies and then I had an invitation to go and work with a group in, in Palestine. So I thought, okay, I'll go and see what this is about. And I was appalled, I was shocked. I couldn't believe that um, all this time that I'd been working with the Israeli companies, no one had ever mentioned this kind of dirty secret that had been swept under the rug of what life was going on out there in, in the occupied territories. I was also amazed and enthralled by the passion of the bigger and the um, uh, dreams of Palestinian artists and dancers working there. So Israeli groups who sought to um, uh, have heard of the work that I was doing there then asked me can I go and um, help liaise with the Palestinian groups to set up some collaborative events. And at the time I was still entering into it and I was thinking, oh, I don't know, I don't know how they feel about it. So I went and talked to them and they said no. Um, and I thought, well, this just makes the Palestinians look like outright refusal, and so they're not even considering it, they're just being almost uh, racist and satisfying then a, um, a long-held persecution complex amongst uh, those who are supporting Zionism. And that, oh yeah, they just hate us, and so that's why they don't work, work with us. So I asked them, well, what would it take if you work with an Israeli? We grew up with this, and this was back in 2000, and they said, well, ultimately, four things, and this was working through the different dance and theater companies there. And they said, well, they'd have to, First, not serve in the military. How can we go and um, you know dance with someone one week and next week is going to be holding us up at a checkpoint? It's in, um, you know 
completely un unconscionable. The second, they'd have to uh, publicly condemn the military occupation. And always with Israelis in the discussions I had with them, they'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know it's bad, but no, we can't come out and say it. And they'd say, no, you have to publicly say it out loud. But they'd also have to uh, publicly condemn settlements and building of settlements and subsequently the war in, in the West Bank. And, and the last one of all was publicly support the right of return. And if individual Israelis could uh, do that, then they said, yes, we would work with those people. So I took this back to all of the companies. Um, I wrote letters to every um, artistic director in, in um, Israel, uh, published several articles, went back with uh, uh, conferences. And amongst them all, though, the, um, uh, there was no take up of that offer. They all said, oh, we lose our funding. We can't do it. I said, OK, fine. But that's what would be the required things if you want to come in through a channel. Uh, to, to work with Palestinians. And I maintain to this day that as an approach, as having more perhaps <laughs> effect internally within the society than the outright refusal, we won't work with anyone until their government does a U-turn. Um, basically because it is uh, using a language and a, a, a desire of <coughs> reconciliation, a, a, a movement towards a more uh, pluralistic and tolerant society for all peoples and not simply a refusal and denial of on government policies in, in, in the UK. And the frustration we felt um, and I was very moved by something that Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, said at that time. And he, he said, he saw the protest marches and he saw the refusal of the, the, the Western governments to even listen to those. He said, we can no longer see the West as monoliths uh, through these marches. They may not have had the impact of stopping the war, but at least they've illustrated to us that people there do challenge and, and um, protest against the decisions. And they are now simply the West. How we go on from here and maintain both a strong position to refuse Israeli uh, continued aggression, to refuse to invest and support Israel, and yet use language that allows people to feel that they can still have pathways through and that Palestinians internally should not feel shunned. I think uh, you brought up a, a great point before when you said the Irish activists came to Gaza Strip and were angry when they saw the use of um, uh, Israeli products. I think, well, that's great self-righteous anger, lucky for you. Mm -hmm. But um, it becomes a vanity, that anger, and perhaps a channel for our other frustrations, rather than a pathway that's pragmatically going to allow society to construct a future that does a, is built on the values that we share here, of tolerance, pluralism, uh, and inclusion. So I just want to put that out as a provocation for today's discussions, that when we are considering how we may engage with the boycott and uh, uh, the BDS campaign, um, how we can do so in a way that allows pathways, that supports growth, and allows Palestinians within, uh, living under occupation, to not necessarily feel alienated if they are by force requiring medical attention, requiring food, that these are the only pathways open to